There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Billy Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Billy. Billy. Hey, Twisters, what up? Thank you for your patience. Usually, I'm able to get an episode out every week, sometimes two episodes within 10 days. Yeah, I don't really have a set schedule, and I have to tell you that's probably the way it's always going to be because, you know, single mom, podcaster, writer, corporate America. I shoot for Tuesdays and Saturdays. I don't always hit that goal, but it's been two weeks since the last episode. It's been a crazy few weeks. The kid broke her ankle. We thought she was going to need surgery. We got a second opinion at Nemours, which is the best hospital for children, in my opinion. The kid is on a scooter with a cast. She's got to check up in a few weeks to make sure that things are healing. And then I fall down the fucking steps and tear my MCL. So that made getting into my home recording space a little difficult. But here I am. Shady's back. Back again. Yeah, I can't sing for shit, but I feel like Slim Shady right now because I'm back. How the hell are you? I missed you guys. And I know some of you missed me. Thank you so much for all your kind posts on Facebook and Twitter. And I love the meme from Esther from Once Upon a Crime. She sent me a meme about vodka when you're sick. What up, Esther? Okay, so first order of business, let's share some what ups. What up to some recent reviewers on iTunes from Cherry Cakes, from A Records, Bella Rose, Joe Sturdivant, and I probably didn't say that correctly, and from Miatra Mama. Man, I read your comments, which are super nice, and I'm like, are you guys listening to my show? Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to subscribe and leave a review. I'm so grateful. I really appreciate your kind words. And A Records, I will not change a thing. In fact, I already said fuck, which normally I don't say until later in the show, but my knee is frigging killing me right now. But I'm so sick of not recording, so I'm just sucking it up and the Vicodin is helping. Okay, so now it's November. Like, where the hell did this year go? It's Thanksgiving in two weeks. I cannot believe it. Time did not move this fast when I was a kid, and it feels like it's moving even faster than it was five or ten years ago. I guess that's because I'm getting old or something. Since starting this podcast, I've been sucked into so many memories of childhood and my teens and my 20s. As I research true crime cases, I'm taken back to the places where I grew up, places where I hung out on the weekends with friends. In a way, that's making me feel older because these places have changed so much over the past 20 to 30 years. Yet at the same time, it reconnects me to my past, and it makes me think about being a teenager again, wearing black lipstick and black nail polish all the time. If there are any spots that remind me of being a teenager, it's the Granite Run Mall and the Springfield Mall. Both malls opened in 1974 when I was about five years old, so I don't really remember a time when the malls weren't there. Granite Run Mall was out off of Route 1 in Lima, PA, but from where I lived, we used to take back roads through Newtown Square and Rose Tree, Pennsylvania to get there. And we used to pass this burned down old mansion that everyone thought was haunted. It was called the Heilbrunn Mansion, but we used to call it the Hellburn Mansion because as kids, we swore that was a gate to hell. Yeah, that'll be an episode in the future, but The Granite Run Mall scared me a little bit, and I know that sounds stupid to be scared of a mall, but it did. Like, I always thought it was really dark inside, and we drove past a house from hell that we swore was still burning when you drove past it at night. So I always liked the Springfield Mall better. Springfield is a town about 10 miles outside of Philly, and the mall opened so long ago, the original anchor stores were Bamberger's and John Wanamaker's. Like, Bamberger's, for fuck's sake. Does anybody besides me remember Bamberger's? In the 80s, Bambergers got swapped out for Macy's, and then it seemed like the Springfield Mall got very posh because Macy's was one of the stores in the new King of Prussia court that opened up in the 80s. Wanamaker's was swapped out for Hecht's in the mid-90s. When Hecht's opened, I was like, what the hell is Hecht's? I'd never even heard of that store. And then about a year and a half later after Hecht's, because I guess it didn't work out, it got swapped out for Strawbridge's. Even though we had a Strawbridge's about a half a mile down the street from the mall, And then that Strawbridge's down the street became a target. And then the Strawbridge's in the mall became a target about seven years ago because, you know, you can't have enough targets in a five-mile radius. Today and 
Certainly over the past 10 years or so, I've tried to stop shopping at malls and look for more independent businesses either online or smaller towns whenever I can. But truth be told, in the 80s, I was a mall brat. When Kevin Smith released Mall Brats, even though it was a few years after I was actually a mall brat, I was like, that was me. And speaking of Kevin Smith, I am still furious that our old Granite Run Mall, which closed in 2015, is not going to be the location for the Mall Brat sequel. Yeah, Kevin Smith came to Delco and he checked out the vacant mall and wanted to start filming. But apparently leaving the empty mall standing a few months longer than planned so we could have the Mall Brat sequel filmed right here in Delco wasn't as important as getting it leveled to the ground to put in a strip mall and even more big box stores. Remember, we've already got two targets right down the street. Okay, so why am I talking about malls and being a mall brat? Well, because I'm going to tell you the tale of a spree killing that took place at the Springfield Mall in 1985, when I was 16 and hanging out at these malls damn near every weekend. This is the story of a woman named Sylvia Segrist, who the locals called Ms. Rambo, a disturbed young woman who was often seen marching in the malls, ranting and yelling, not making any sense. Someone that we thought was just the local crazy girl, and it turned out she was much more disturbed than any of us realized. 1985 was the days of Chess King and Z Cavarici pants, the days of the 579 shop when I wore a size 78 and thought I was fat. Please, ladies and gentlemen, raise your girls to love their shape no matter what size they wear. Please teach them to focus on health and fitness and self-worth, not fitting into a single digit size to feel valuable. There was a Benetton store. God, those stupid wide striped oversized sweaters that were so expensive. There was a Spencer's. I mean, we've still got Spencer's. But back in the day, um, some of my friends and I, we used to go into Spencer's in the back of the store and pretend that we were checking out the blacklight posters when we were really giggling over all the adult toys and raunchy cards and T-shirts. There was a merry-go-round in the Granite Run Mall and a Chess King in the Springfield Mall. Merry-go-round is where my dad bought my Michael Jackson jacket for Valentine's Day when I was 13. Not the fake pleather shit, but the real lambskin leather with stainless steel chainmail on the shoulders and 27 zippers with teeny tiny pockets. Hello, spoiled. Yes, that was me. I was not at the Springfield Mall on October 30th in 1985, but I probably would have been there the weekend before. If not exactly the weekend before, I was there a few times a month, like every single month. And I remember occasions seeing a woman, and I say woman because at 16, when I saw a 25-year-old, she would have seemed like a grown-up to me. But I remember a few times I'd see this crazy woman walking around the mall or people would be talking about the crazy woman who came in the mall and say things like, oh, she was in here yesterday rambling to herself again, or, oh yeah, the army leader was talking about nuclear war again, or some other shit like that. This crazy woman had a name, Sylvia Winanda Segrist. Sylvia grew up in Springfield, Pennsylvania, and not much is available about her life before she turned 15, other than she claimed she was sexually assaulted by her grandfather, And shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. I've used the term crazy woman, and that's pretty damn ignorant. I use that to call out my ignorance and the ignorance of others when I was a teenager. I knew the word schizophrenia, but I probably wouldn't even have considered it. I was a spoiled suburban kid shopping with daddy's money, rolling my eyes at the woman that no one understood. While I was researching this story, I realized that although I peripherally knew what schizophrenia was, I didn't actually know much about the condition other than it's like a break with reality that can hit at puberty. So, of course, I go to the internet and type in the word schizophrenia into a Bing search, and the first three hits look like they'll be informative websites, but when you click on them, it's a massive drug advertisement. Sure, ads for drugs to treat schizophrenia, but seriously... Like the first hits are promoting prescription drug companies. And of course they are, because it's always about the almighty dollar. Okay, off my soapbox. But my minimal understanding of schizophrenia wasn't far off. The textbook definition is like a breakdown between thought, behavior, and emotion. It's more common than I realized, and it's a lifelong and sometimes debilitating disease for which there is no cure. Certainly there's treatment through medication and therapy, but this isn't something that ever goes away. 
Schizophrenia impacts someone's ability to interact in social settings. It could affect somebody's ability to get and keep a job or to maintain relationships, to be in school. It can possibly negatively impact every aspect of someone's life if they're not effectively treated. And every sufferer is different. Some people have few psychotic episodes. Some people have more of them more frequently. Some people become completely unable to distinguish between what's real and what isn't. And as we tell the story of Sylvia Segrist, I think she falls into that latter category. I read that symptoms of schizophrenia take on many different shapes and sizes. Some people have delusions or hallucinations. Some people simply become withdrawn. Some people can seem normal. And I really hate using that word normal because normal also comes in many shapes and sizes. But they seem mentally and emotionally healthy until they actually tell you what's going on inside their head, and then that shit is terrifying for some people. This is going to sound stupid, but honestly, there are times where I've been like, do I talk to myself too much? I mean, we all have an inner voice, right? But usually we know it's our own inner voice and not voices that we think are someone else talking to us, telling us to do nasty shit. Although occasionally my inner voice will tell me my ass looks big in these jeans and I need to get back on the elliptical. While schizophrenia can hit at any age, it often appears with or after the onset of adolescence. And many schizophrenics are diagnosed in their teens or early 20s. And I can't imagine how terrifying that must be, because as if you don't already feel like you're going crazy with all the biological and emotional shit going on in your body as you become a teenager, now you're dealing with schizophrenia and not being able to control your thinking or your emotions. And You know, you may not be certain if this is just normal adolescent changes or if it's something worse. Like, it has to be terrifying. So we know Sylvia Segrist was diagnosed with schizophrenia around the age of 15. And we know her condition was significant because between the ages of 15 and 25, Sylvia had been committed to mental hospitals 12 times. The first time she got committed, she was actually taken out from her high school directly to a state hospital. Like, imagine trying to live that down. Her parents, Donald and Ruth Segrist, who lived in Springfield, Pennsylvania, were desperately trying to get help for their daughter. And at the same time, they were terrified to be around her because of her extreme violent tendencies. In 1981, Sylvia was committed to Haverford State Hospital because she stabbed a woman who worked at the Tri-County Fountain Center in Lansdowne. This was a counseling center and a resource for folks who needed support. Now, her attorney in this case was a man named David Black from Media, and he defended Sylvia and got her into the Delaware County Accelerated Rehabilitative Disposition Program. So this was like a pretrial intervention program that was available to first-time offenders. And what it does is it takes them out of the criminal justice system. Through this program, she was involuntarily committed to Haverford State for 90 days. And to be on the safe side, because she was violent, the judge sentenced her to another 90 days. So she was there for a total of six months. While she was at Haverford State, Sylvia went back and forth between talking about getting healthy and getting her life back on track, and then rant about the horrible state of the world, complaining about the government, and telling others how she wanted to hurt people. So eventually she left Haverford State, and in 1983 she was living near Media, Pennsylvania, a town just a few miles from the Springfield Mall. About that same time, her former attorney, David Black, started getting anonymous letters that were threatening. And he believed these letters were from Sylvia. He said that they were long, rambling missives about the failure of the system, and they contained at least what he felt were threats on his life. There wasn't a direct threat, like, I'm going to kill you, but words and language around hurting someone and possibly hurting him. The letters conflict with actual police reports from this time. So there was a report that there was a loaded gun removed from Sylvia's apartment, but the media police had no record of a gun ever being removed from her home. Now, they were certainly called to her house often enough by neighbors for disturbances, but nothing for a loaded gun. There were reports at this time that Sylvia threatened to kill her parents and then shoot people in a public space. Now, David Black, her former attorney, also said one letter in particular in the fall of 1984 threatened President Ronald Reagan, who was planning a visit to media that year. And David Black actually contacted the Secret Service. But when they reviewed the letters, they didn't think there was anything to be taken seriously about these threats. Sylvia's former attorney and the media police, plus her parents, are aware of her erratic behavior. They're all aware of violent threats in these letters. But there really isn't any action to be taken because in 1976, the Mental Health Act deemed that a person must be a danger to himself or to others because of their mental condition before they can be involuntarily committed. 
Now, I don't know about you, but stabbing someone and then threatening repeated acts of violence against other people sure as hell sounds like you're a danger to other people, even if not to yourself. But those letters weren't taken seriously. To be involuntarily committed, someone has to submit paperwork, a petition called a 302. And what that does is it documents someone's violent tendencies. And then that petition is submitted to a mental health professional who decides whether or not the patient needs to be examined by a psychiatrist. And then if the petition is approved, there's a hearing within five days to determine what treatment is necessary. Because Sylvia hadn't demonstrated a violent event within 30 days, even though she was writing letters threatening violence against her attorney, against her family, and against strangers, no one could submit a petition. Now, I don't know for certain if this is the process today, but this was the process in the mid to late 80s. And that Mental Health Act of 1976 was actually amended in 78 to include the words threatens harm and the likelihood to carry out the acts. So the problem with that is the law becomes interpretive. It depends on how someone interprets the patient's threats and behavior, which in Sylvia Segrist's case, no one interpreted it to be all that likely that Sylvia would hurt someone, which I find shocking. She stabbed someone just two years before this period of time where she was making all of these threats. And then she threatens a variety of people. But no one thought she would actually hurt anyone, except there was someone who was afraid that Sylvia would actually hurt people. And that was her mother. Sylvia's attorney, David Black, confronted her about the letters, and Sylvia admitted that she wrote them. So he made arrangements with her to get the letters back. And after that, she began to visit his office on a somewhat frequent basis. And each time she would visit, she would bring more letters. She would bring newspaper articles. She would bring magazine articles that supported her delusions and position about the state of the world. Now, she would give all of these clippings and letters to her attorney's secretary, and the secretary would store Sylvia's documents in a black supply box. During one visit in April 1985, Sylvia spent time talking with David Black, and he was quoted as remembering that she said things like, sometimes I just want to get a gun and off some people. She was often agitated during her visits, so again, she tells her attorney she wants to kill people, but no one thinks that's enough of a threat to start a 302 petition. There are so many stories of neighbors about Sylvia Segrist. There are stories that she would go out at four in the morning to rake leaves, and she would rake leaves up and down the street in the dark. There are stories about her marching up and down the steps in her apartment a half a dozen times over and over while ranting about nuclear war and the government and how she would fix things by killing people. She would often say she was going to go out and get a gun. In high school, Sylvia drank a bottle of furniture polish at a party because when she said she wanted to kill herself, kids at the party said they didn't believe her. She has a history of meaning everything that she says. But I think what happened with all these threats she was making throughout 1983 and 1984, people, including her attorney, looked at Sylvia Segrist the way many of us who saw her hanging out at the Springfield Mall and at a local fitness center in the library used to say about her. They saw her as just a crazy woman who talked to herself and wore army clothing. Her threats, her delusions, and her emotional breakdowns really escalated throughout 83 and 84. By July of 1985, Sylvia's mother, Ruth Segrist, wrote a piece for a local Springfield newspaper about her daughter and about the struggle she had finding the right mental health support for Sylvia, about the lack of support Ruth received when she tried to get Sylvia committed because she hadn't demonstrated a recent violent episode. She had only communicated constant threats of violence. The piece ended with Ruth asking, what do you need? Blood on the floor? And that was a horrible premonition of deadly events that would unfold just four months later. Not long before the murders at the Springfield Mall in the fall of 1985, Sylvia Segrist tried to buy a gun. She went to a local Kmart, she paid a $20 deposit, and when she went back to pick up the gun, she was told by Kmart employees that her permit hadn't been approved. There was yet another reason for Sylvia to be pissed off at the government, but that was actually a lie. The Kmart employees never submitted any paperwork. They just didn't want to sell her a gun because they didn't trust what she would do with it. Her frantic demeanor, wearing fatigues from head to toe, ranting, muttering to herself while she was in the store, the employees didn't want to sell her a gun. They didn't trust what she would do, so they refunded her deposit and turned her away. If only that had been the end of it. If only someone had listened to her mother or taken her threat seriously, or only if she'd been a turned away the second time she tried to buy a gun. But she wasn't. 
The next store she visited was Best, not Best Buy, just Best. And I so remember the store when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. Best was the kind of store where you could buy a boombox, an electric can opener, some fluffy towels, and a rifle. So Sylvia walked into Best on October 22nd, 1985. She lied on her application and said she did not have a mental health condition. And nobody checked those things in the 80s. Shit, I don't even know if they check them now. She paid $107 and she bought herself a semi-automatic rifle. Now, she went back and picked up the gun on October 29th, and we know this because a neighbor who lived across the street from Crazy Sylvia saw her carry a gun case into her apartment around 2.30 in the afternoon. This is a woman that the neighbors were fearful of. This is a woman whom her neighbors constantly called the police about her erratic and threatening behavior. Yet, when a neighbor sees her carry a gun into her apartment, he does nothing. So what happened on October 30th, 1985, the day before Halloween? In the hours before the shootings began, Sylvia made a number of stops around Springfield. At around 11 a.m., she called her former attorney's office, David Black, and told him that she would be coming in for her box of papers, all of her threatening letters and her magazine articles. She showed up later that day around 1.30 in the afternoon to pick up the Black file box, and that's something that she repeatedly referenced after the shootings. Sylvia went to the mall around 11 a.m., and then she left. Now, she was seen by numerous people, store employees and shoppers. They saw her wearing army fatigues and black, shiny military boots. But this was a common scene. Many times over the summer of 1985, Sylvia had been escorted out of the mall by mall security or by Springfield police for screaming at everyone and screaming at no one, ranting in the shops, in the McDonald's, screaming in Lerner's clothing store, and Lerner's eventually became New York and Company. Actually, just a few weeks before the shooting, she had an episode in Lerner's screaming that the colors were too bright and none of the clothing would fit. One week before the shooting, Sylvia went to the Rite Aid in the Springfield Mall to pick up a refill for Xanax, which the pharmacist wouldn't fill because she didn't have the right prescription card on her. And again, she demonstrated erratic, agitated behavior in the very spot she would return to and open fire. But no one who saw her ranting around the mall or marching up and down the corridors thought she was truly violent. No one thought Sylvia Segrist would ever make good on her threats to kill people. Sylvia left the Springfield Mall that day around 1 p.m., and from there she went to Living Well Fitness, and that was a local fitness center in Springfield where she had a membership for about a year. She had a habit of visiting the sauna in the fitness center wearing her clothes, which usually, again, were army fatigues, and her obsession with fatigues were because she tried to join the army and she was dishonorably discharged while she was in boot camp. The army recognized very early on that she had significant mental problems. So that just fueled her fire and her hatred of the system and society and government. Like the mall, gym members and employees were used to Sylvia yelling and talking about killing people. On the 30th, she lifted weights for a few minutes, and then she left. And after she left the gym, she went to the Swarthmore Public Library. And there's a pattern growing here. Just like the mall, just like the gym, the library staff and patrons all had stories of Sylvia's erratic behavior stories of her public outbursts, and this visit on the 30th was no different. She didn't stay long at the library either. She left right after 2 p.m., and then by 3 o'clock, she was at a party store in a nearby town buying Halloween napkins. Like, that is so random. Like, I'm going to go buy some Halloween napkins before I head to the mall and kill a bunch of people. And no one's going to stop me because no one takes me seriously except my parents, but no one takes their fears seriously, so there's no stopping me now. Sylvia returned to the Springfield Mall around 3.30 p.m. on Wednesday, October 30th in 1985. She parked at what is considered the front of the mall on the Route 1 side, which is a, a very large road with other shopping complexes. But to me, that was always the back of the mall. And she parks her Datsun B210. Now, I shit you not, what car did my parents give me when I started driving? My mom's old Datsun B210. Yep, I had the same car as our local spree killer although probably a lot of kids had that same car besides me. So I want to pause for a minute because I'm going to talk now about the events as they unfolded at the Springfield Mall. So I want to warn folks, I'm going to be talking about a mass shooting. And if that's something that's a trigger for you or too much to bear, shit, it may be too much for me to bear, but this certainly won't be the first time you guys have heard me cry. If it's too much for you, then please, with all genuine love and affection, I can send you 
across the podcast airwaves, I would encourage you to stop listening now. Come back and join us for part two, where we talk about Sylvia's trial and the last 30 years since Sylvia Segrist was incarcerated. If you're sticking with me, here goes. So Sylvia parks her car, she gets out, and she just starts shooting. There is no rhyme or reason to it. And the first person she shoots at is a man getting tools out of his truck who's parked nearby. It's a man named Ed Seats. Sylvia fired at Ed, but she missed. She gets closer to the mall, and then she fires at a woman using a Mac machine outside the mall entrance, but she misses again. Near the woman using the Mac machine outside the mall is the Wootson family. Mario Wootson with his sister Gina, her 10-year-old daughter Tiffany, their young nephew, Rasif Kosman, who was only two years old, their little niece, Corrine, who was nine, and her cousin, Pia Williams, who was also only two years old. The Wootons and their extended family were at the mall for a fitting. The mall was loaning out children's clothing for an upcoming charity fashion show at the Wooten's church, and the little ones were being fitted like models to be in the fashion show. Sylvia fired and fired and fired. She fired on that family walking into the mall, and the first shot hit little two-year-old Rasif Kosman in the chest. This is absolutely no consolation, but he didn't suffer. He was killed instantly because he was so small. Gina Wootson's daughter Tiffany was struck by a bullet and among the injured, as was her cousin Kareen. Now Kareen is a little nine-year-old badass because she jumped in front of her other two-year-old cousin Pia to protect her when the shot started and Kareen got struck in the face. She survived and probably saved the life of her cousin Pia. After almost slaughtering the children in the Wootson's family, Sylvia entered the mall. Now the shots outside could be heard within the mall, but people didn't know what to think. They thought her gun was fake. They thought she was dressed for Halloween. It was mischief night, or at least mischief day. And I don't know if mischief night is a thing in other parts of the country, but certainly here in Pennsylvania, on parts of the East Coast, it's the day before Halloween and people go out and they cause some mischief. They throw toilet paper at people's trees. And, you know, it used to be really innocent when I was younger. And I don't know if it's so innocent anymore. It certainly wasn't innocent in 1985. But because it's the day before Halloween and there's other people in the mall in costume, in fact, the mall would hire someone to come in and dress as a cowboy to start handing out candy because Halloween was the next day. So, so many people in the mall, like they weren't sure what she was doing. They thought this was something for Halloween. Mall employees and other shoppers were quoted as saying they thought this was something for the kids, like the cowboy, until they heard the cries and the screams. Sylvia Segrist fired without warning, without aiming, and without thinking. She fired into stores. She fired into clusters of mall shoppers standing in corridors. She fired into stores that I remember so well, like Kinney's Shoes and Bressler's Ice Cream. And outside of Bressler's Ice Cream, she hit a woman from Ridley Park, which is a town nearby the mall, a woman named Mary Gervaisi, who got hit twice in the stomach, but she survived. And when I reread the stories and interviews from 30 years ago, like I can almost picture every step she took. I see the mall in my head the way it looked in 1985. She fired near a store named Herder's Cutlery, which was next to one of the big anchor stores, John Wanamaker's. And I remember that store. I remember Chess King. I remember GNC. I remember where Gordon's Jewelers was. And there's so many stories about employees at Gordon's locking themselves in the vault. I can picture the route that Sylvia took as she walked the upper corridor of the mall, just firing indiscriminately. Near Herder's Cutlery, Sylvia Segrist shot a well-known Springfield gynecologist, a man named Dr. Ernest Trout. Many of the mall employees and shoppers even knew Dr. Trout because they were his patients. He died from his injuries the next day. There are stories from the mall that day of store managers and employees protecting one another, ushering shoppers into back rooms and behind counters. Sylvia just marched her way through the mall, firing into stores, firing over the balcony of the second floor down into the corridor below, not knowing if she was hitting anyone and not caring. She fired into a furniture store called Pearl of the East and this is so trivial, but I remember that store so well because it was one of my favorite stores. They had these beautiful ornate futons and I wanted a futon so badly and my parents said it wouldn't be comfortable and I had a wonderful bed. Why did I need a futon? God, I loved browsing in that store, looking at the ornate vases and beautifully carved Japanese screens. And you think about the beauty in that space and then the carnage that's going on outside and inside because she's shooting at the store. Just outside Pearl of the East, there was a retired Philadelphia City employee named Augusto Ferrara, and he was shot and killed while his wife stood by his side. 
Sylvia tried to shoot his wife, but she missed. The bullet passed above her head and went into the ceiling. It seemed to so many people in the mall that day that the shooting would never end until a young man named John Lawfer saw Sylvia Segrist. John was a 24-year-old Middletown Township resident from Delaware County, Pennsylvania, again, not far from the mall. John heard shots behind him, and like so many of the other shoppers when the carnage began, John thought it was a Halloween prank. He thought it was something in very bad taste to be scaring people like this. When John saw Sylvia with her gun on her hip, he began walking towards her, and she kept firing. Now, even though she was kind of a bad shot, and that sounds horrible for me to say that because she did hit so many people, but with the way she was firing, she could have hit so many more. John is walking towards Sylvia, and he thinks that she's firing blanks because even though she's shooting at him, she isn't hitting him. And when he gets right in front of her, he simply took the gun away from her and told her he was turning her into the police. That was it. Five minutes of bloodshed and terror and hysteria ended with a young man simply walking up to Sylvia Segrist and taking the gun out of her hands. There was no fighting. There was no tackling, as some news outlets reported at the time. Sylvia muttered something to him about having a medical condition and family issues. John walked Sylvia into the nearby shoe store, Kinney's, and he sat her down in a chair until mall security arrived. One of the mall security guards pulled her onto the floor. He cuffed her. He held her down while he was waiting for police, and he repeatedly asked her, why did you do this? Why did you kill all these people? And Sylvia just kept saying, my family makes me nervous. And she repeated over and over, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. By 3.45, only a mere 15 minutes after Sylvia arrived at the mall, the Springfield police showed up and the police escorted her outside while an announcement was made over the loudspeakers asking for doctors or nurses, anybody that had any medical training on the premises to help the victims. Ambulances began to arrive with helicopters and police continued searching the mall because, see, the problem was the initial call about the shooting stated it was a male gunman. They didn't think that Sylvia acted alone. They thought she was working with a male accomplice. But the male gunman was Sylvia. Many witnesses who saw her assumed that she was a man. She was dressed in oversized fatigues with those huge black army boots and a hat. You couldn't see her face. And people, naively, never thought a woman would be capable of something like this. So the scene inside the mall continued to be chaos and confusion. A Springfield Township police officer was running by the stores telling everyone to stay inside while, just a few seconds later, a Pennsylvania state police officer was yelling at people to get out, so they didn't know what to do. There was confusion about the victims, too, about how many people were injured, whether they were male or female. Little Recife Cosman, Sylvia's first victim, was thought to be a little girl. But in fairness to both the Springfield police and the Pennsylvania state police, this was unlike anything that had ever happened in suburban Philadelphia. And there was so much shooting and so many injured. It's understandable that there may have been some mistaken identities of victims at first and a mistaken identity of the shooter because, for Christ's sake, she looked like a dude. Sylvia killed three people that day, Little Recife Cosman, Dr. Ernest Trout, and Augusto Ferrara, and she severely injured seven other people because her parents made her nervous, because she heard voices, because she made threats about killing people for over two years and no one took her threat seriously, because no one would listen to her parents, especially her mother, who believed that Sylvia would do something that would end in bloodshed. She even wrote about her fears just a few months before this incident in the Springfield Press. Sylvia Segrist was arraigned just a few hours later on Wednesday, October 30th in 1985, and she screamed at the police, I did it, just kill me now. A friend of hers from high school said he thought she would have eventually turned the gun on herself that day, but she didn't get the chance. John Lawfer, the man who stopped her from injuring or killing even more people, as you can imagine, turned into an overnight sensation, and that was certainly not his own desire. He was called a hero, but John said he did what anyone would do, or at least what he hoped anyone would do, and he certainly wasn't seeking the limelight. John eventually went on to become a Pennsylvania state police officer, and today he is the chief of police in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which is a town about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Philadelphia on the way to Lancaster. And that black box that Sylvia picked up from her attorney's office earlier that day, well, she called that her testimony. She told the police they could just read the contents of the box. Which makes me wonder, had she been planning this attack since 1983 when she first started sending those anonymous threat letters to her attorney? Because once she admitted to writing them, she wrote even more and she would drop them off for safekeeping in that black file box. 
Yeah, I think she'd been planning this for quite some time. And if not actually planning, because, you know, I don't know, based on her mental state, if she could meticulously plan something like this with a debilitating mental condition for which she refused to take her medication, but at least thinking about it. Jesus, this is heavy. This is a fucking heavy story. So I'm going to stop there. This is a two-part story. In part two of Ms. Rambo, we will talk about Sylvia Segrist's trial. We'll talk about her incarceration. And we'll talk about her mental health condition and the state of mental health for adults today. That's a topic I don't know much about. Mental health laws and treatments for adults with significant mental health diseases, how it's treated, what we as a state in Pennsylvania or as a country can and should be doing better. I don't know much about that. So... I really want to thank one of our Twisted Philly listeners, Jen, who was kind enough to agree to an email interview where I email her a bunch of questions. And then based on her answers, I try to educate myself and all of you. She has graciously offered to share her knowledge and education and experience as a mental health professional. So we'll pick up Sylvia's story again in part two. I know often when podcasters talk about true crime stories. We really want to talk about the victims. I definitely tried to do that in part one. But the more I read about Sylvia and the frustrations of her family, the fears of her mom, I hate saying this could have been avoided because it happened. So you can't go back in time. But I really feel like I need to educate myself more about what we do to support adults with mental health. And I think it's important that we tell that side of the story as well. So that's what we're going to get into in part two. I hope you come back for the second half of Ms. Rambo, which will be up in a few days. And that's it from me for part one. Ciao for now, Twisters.